This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Sean Powers and I will be joined this week by Brian Deere, who has a new book out called The Friendly Orange Glow. And it's about the ancestor of much of the things that we value in the open source world today. Coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 591. Recorded Wednesday, August 12th, 2020. Plato and the Rise of Cyberculture. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Allow your remote workforce the ability to do their best work without jumping through hoops. Ensure your business's security with LastPass. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by Security Scorecard. Security Scorecard helps enterprises manage digital threats with a 360 degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. To learn more and sign up for your free account, visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. Hey everybody, I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And uh, I'm joined this week by Sean Powers himself. And he is, he should appear any second now. Come in, Sean. There he is. Okay, with the, <laughs> the, with the best set, the best headphones, the best gear. Uh, my old Linux Journal colleague of many years. And uh, so so where where are you this week? I know, I know, but... Uh, uh, same and, place as always, right? That's how the quarantine world works here. I'm in my office. Uh, it's not a green screen. This is actually, I'm still here. This so, is, you're uh, actually still, and you yeah. still have your flamethrower there behind you. I I do, I do. And um, actually, I could show you a picture. Do you want to see a picture of my yes, actual flamethrower? Here yeah, is my flamethrower in is. action. The best wow. part isn't that I got to use it. The best part is that my wife took a picture for me. So, um, yeah, yeah well, it's, uh, it's, I married it's well. It's, it's done in the, in the autumn, and it's a great way to clear up the clear up the leaves, <laughs> I suppose. So are, are, you, are you familiar with uh, Brian Deere, our guest this week, and his Amazing work. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to confess, I'm not all the way through the book. It's a it's a big book, but it's the kind of thing where I was reading it, you know, because it's going to be on the show. I'm going to actually finish it even after the show with with when I don't even have to because it's awesome. Um, <laughs> I also discovered that Brian is into electric cars. I really hope we can talk a little bit about electric cars, we'll, uh, we'll even if it's in the after show, uh, because uh, yeah. Now that'll I, be I, during I, the show. We can still talk. The electric cars are a plus topic. They're totally a plus topic. Anything I, we say is a plus topic is a plus topic. So we're cool. Yeah. But but first, before we get into it, um, uh, we're going to appreciate our um, our sponsors. And this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Uh, when LastPass surveyed global IT decision makers, ninety six percent of organizations said. Their remote workforce has impacted their identity and access management strategy. How can you manage identities and promote good security behaviors when your employees are remote? Well, you can with LastPass. LastPass allows for secure password storage, give employees their own vault for storing every app and login they use. Convenient password sharing, make it easy for employees to share logins while keeping access to corporate data safe streamlined logins, capture and fill every credential without disrupting an employee's workflow, centralize control, enforce policies and get actionable insights into employee password behavior from an admin dashboard, simplified user management, instantly add and remove users or automate user management with directory integration, access from anywhere, no matter where employees work, they always have their passwords with them from any device. When user identities are centrally and securely managed, a business can ensure that the correct employee is doing the right thing and has the right access. They'll work more efficiently when they can have access to the data and resources they need easily. LastPass's IAM solutions help businesses improve 
employee experience, and safeguard from cyber threats. And our business uses it. Everybody here uses LastPass here at Twit. So let your remote workforce focus on their work without compromising your business's security. Secure your remote workforce with LastPass. Go to lastpass.com slash twit. That's lastpass.com slash twit. Okay, well, welcome. Welcome, uh, uh, Brian Deere. Brian, Brian is, uh, is, in addition to being an old friend and uh, um, and somebody we've I've known for many years for the many countless conferences, which we're not even holding anymore, except very virtually. But I, long before we had open source, we had free uh, free uh, software. And long before we had free software, we had people who abided by the principles of that and did amazing creative work. And Brian, uh, Brian has done uh, a, a book about that, uh, The Friendly Orange Glow, about Plato. And he's here to talk to us about Plato and other things. One of those other things, of, among many, he's a longtime veteran of uh, many companies, many startups, uh, and many mature companies as well, is that he's uh, the founder and president of the Tesla's Owner Club of New Mexico, which has more than 425 members. Uh, and he plays musical instruments, some of which may or may not be in his background, uh, <laughs> produced <laughs> five to seven albums. And it's a long paragraph of too many things that he's done. So I'm going to let him fill us in, maybe starting with uh, with Plato and, and its significance to us. Hey, Brian. Hey, uh, good to see you guys. Um, so, yeah, Plato goes so far back. It's um, and and uh, it's it somehow became so unknown that um, it just it almost disappeared from history. And that was kind of the worry I had that kept me going for so many years. Um, I worked on the book for um, an embarrassingly long time, 32 years, um, starting in the mid 1980s um, when I was still using the Plato system. And uh, I just decided, you know, uh, 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 Steve Levy's book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, had come out. And it was, you know, that plus um, uh, uh, Tom Wolfe's book on uh, the astronauts, uh, The Right Stuff. These two books came out in uh, late 70s, early 80s, and I was just blown away by them. They were so exciting to read, uh, all about technology and engineering and all these interesting things. And I always felt that the Plato story um, was kind of volume two of Hacker's. And it pained me as the years went by that nobody was doing anything uh, about, you know, no book was coming out about Plato. And uh, the Plato system itself was rapidly sort of going into its, you know, uh, uh, obsolescence phase because it was it ran on mainframes and, uh, you know, they were rapidly disappearing in the age of microcomputers and networked computers and all that kind of stuff and the rise of the internet and everything sort of so eclipsed this vast history of Plato that it nearly disappeared. And, um, I was determined to try to rescue it. And so I, you know, not since there was so little written about Plato, there weren't any documentaries, there weren't any major magazine articles, there weren't any, anything like that. All I could do was track down the Plato people themselves and interview them. And so I just started doing that uh, around 1985. And uh, I, you know, during vacations and, you know, uh, in between jobs or whatever, I would travel around the country and interview more people. And this just went on and on and on. And every time I would talk to somebody, they would give me 20 more names. And I'd realize I can't do anything until I talk to those 20 more people. And then they would give me 20 more names each. And it just went on from there. So I wound up over the years doing about 7 million words of typed interview transcripts. And just doing the transcripts alone took a number of years. Um, but I wound up with a treasure trove of historical background on Plato that uh, – I guess nobody else in the world had, and um, it enabled me to 
it, it took years to try to figure out how to organize it and put it in some kind of structure that would make sense. Um, I was determined to focus on the users and not the muckety mucks, you know, the, the administrators and, and, uh, and all that, you know, it would be like, um, imagine, you know, we, we've seen lots of books on the history of Facebook and Google and Apple and all that stuff. And they're always about the principles and the founders. And while I cover principles and founders too, in, in my book, I was determined to spend a huge amount of time on the users because they made the system, they made the network, and they actually added most of the compelling features that would uh, go on to influence the whole industry um, uh, to this day. So, um, you know, a, a huge chunk of the book, probably 40, 50 percent of it is about um, – the kids, and they were literally high school students and, and college undergrads who who haunted and lurked within the, the online halls of Plato and built it out in the early 70s. And, and um, what, you know, for those who are not familiar with it, you know, um, to understand the Plato system, you know, for the experience as a user, uh, imagine it's 1972 or 73 and you're sitting down at a uh, at a box that has a flat panel gas plasma display with high res graphics, um, multiple text fonts and everything. Um, it's, it has a built in touch screen and um, uh, it's 512 by 512 resolution, which um, was pretty substantial at the time. And, you know, there are uh, vast numbers of um all kinds of entertaining things to do online, um, instant messaging, chat rooms, message forums, uh, multiplayer games on every kind of imaginable, you know, theme or topic or, or whatever, whether they're space war games or uh, sports games or strategy or game uh, uh, dungeon games. Um, and uh, this just goes on and on and on and on and on. And, and, um, uh, there was a full-fledged online community uh, on Plato uh, at a scale and a level of sophistication that uh, to this day I've never found anything else, even what, say, Xerox Park was doing or Stanford or MIT. Um, and uh, no one knew about it outside of the Plato community. And um, this is basically the way things went all during the 70s. It grew and grew and grew. The Plato system was uh, much larger than the membership, all of the users combined on ARPANET until about 1981. And that's when, when ARPANET started exceeding, uh, you know, the, the count, I guess you could say, of uh, total users if, from all over the world. Um, but that's a huge amount of time and a lot happened in there. And, um, you know, there's um, I, I, I just barely skim the surface of some of the highlights of what happened across 640 pages in a book. But we're talking about, you know, a, a, the, the Plato system started in 1960 uh, and it ran on the ILLIAC one uh, computer at the University of Illinois. So um, it started early, uh, so early that they had to do invent everything from scratch, pretty much. Um, uh, RAM was way too expensive and, uh, to use video RAM would have, uh, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per terminal, which is why they went and invented the flat pas uh, flat plasma, uh, gas plasma, uh, display, uh, uh, and got the patent for that. Um, that's the same plasma technology that wound up in televisions later. Um, it was, and you can still see it, you know, in airports and things like that, though a lot of those screens are now LED or OLED or something. But, um, you know, it was a revolutionary invention and it was done for Plato, not for televisions or anything like that. And uh, so Plato users got a first chance at uh, using it. And uh, it, it was, you know, very, very futuristic. So anyway, um, I'll let you ask other questions if you like. <laughs> yes, me, me, me. So, uh, <laughs> Brian, my, my background is in education. Um, 
and so uh, reading this book, it was really exciting for me. And I, I think everybody should read this book because it, it isn't just about Plato. It's about uh it's about learning to educate with computers, which is just near and dear to my heart. So first of all, uh, what does Plato stand for? Because that's significant, right? When we're talking about education. So what does Plato stand right. for? And not, yeah. It stands for uh, programmed logic for automatic teaching operations. And they came up with that uh, silly uh, NASA like acronym in 1960. They needed something and that's what they came up with. And uh, uh, so, yeah. It, and, and the, the word programmed is particularly important because, um, you know, you hear nowadays about online learning. And uh, in fact, because of the pandemic, you're hearing about online learning in schools all the time because many schools are not going to open yet and they're going to try to do everything online. Um, but often what you uh, see now is very different than the thinking back in the 60s and 70s. The idea back then was literally to program a computer to do all the teaching. The student would literally sit at the computer and interact with the computer and the computer would be very patient and ask questions, present material, uh, you know, do some multimedia or whatever. And the entire learning experience from the student's perspective was engaged with the computer. There was no human on the other end. And um, so it was very futuristic. It was ridiculously ambitious. It was highly controversial. Um, and it was very experimental. And yet it did work and produced a lot of very interesting results. And on the Plato system, even in the mid 60s, the University of Illinois campus was already offering full courses for credit um, through Plato. And um, by the 70s, there were hundreds, if not, you know, many hundreds of, of full college courses um, and many uh, classes in um, uh, K through 12 that were offered on the Plato system to students. And um, so it was a pretty major deal. Um, if you happen to be in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois in the 70s, um, growing up and going to school, there was a very good chance that you got exposed to Plato and you probably still remember it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the system was intended for education and um, it was designed, uh, you know, with that as its mission. And the, the organization, the team had a very strong mission sense. And I think that's why they were able to pull off so many uh technical challenges because they just felt they they uh, they were very optimistic, really solid engineers, and they they nailed it in terms of some uh, when you look at the difficulty like uh, plasma displays and stuff, uh, they what they were able to pull off given the meager resources they had is pretty impressive. And um, uh, likewise, you know, there was a lot of skepticism among educators as to whether Plato could teach. And, uh, you know, uh, want to arguably uh, the, debate, the debate continues to this day as to whether that's the case. But what you see nowadays in terms of, quote unquote, online learning is oftentimes um, quite different and nowhere near as sophisticated. Now, there are many exceptions, but you'll see, you know, uh, uh, massive online o open courseware, the MOOCs and things like that, a lot of video stuff where – the teachers have uh, recorded themselves giving a lecture and they break it up into segments and then you watch various segments and then they quiz you on things. And um, because it's the web, um, it's it's strangely often nowhere near as um, responsive and intimate an interaction experience between the user and the computer. You would think that now that we all have, you know, uh, bandwidth in the megabits or gigabits range that um, everything would be lightning fast and yet it isn't. But one of the guiding principles on the Plato system from day one all the way back in 1960 was that it had to be lightning fast. And um, I talk about this throughout the entire book. I use a, I coined a phrase, the, the fast round trip, which um, basically they architected the system so that the moment you pressed the key, a key on the keyboard, 
um, it would travel all across the network to the mainframe and be echoed back to your screen, you know, in about a hundred milliseconds. And, um, that was considered, you know, sh shocking and phenomenal, uh, compared to the typical time sharing system of the sixties or even seventies. And, um, in fact, most architectures were not even set up to do that kind of responsiveness. And when the web came along, it wasn't either. Um, and we still have this goofy architecture, in my opinion. Um, we don't even notice it, but um, uh, you know, it, it is. It, it's not really a super fast two-way uh, uh, thing. It's just there's a lot of illusion that it is. Um, but you know, it, it makes sense why the internet was architected the way it is because of scale. There's no way we could have gotten. Uh, the scale of the internet if we had all gone with Plato, for example. Um, and it's an interesting thought experiment um, that I've pondered over the years. You know, let's say that Plato took off in the Bay Area in the 70s. And there was a reason it didn't, because Stanford made sure it didn't. Um, they considered it, you know, heresy. But um, imagine if Stanford University had embraced Plato like so many other universities had, and suddenly a whole generation of engineers and gamers and startup people and techies or whatever went to school in the Bay Area using the Plato system. Um, you know, and a million, 10 million terminals had been distributed or whatever. Uh, at some point, the architecture simply would not have scaled. And, um, you know, it would have required uh, – hundreds or thousands of mainframes and, you know, the, the expense would have been uh, pretty considerable. Um, but then you consider the fact that, you know, what are what is a data center for Google or Facebook or Yahoo or any, you know, Netflix or whatever? Um, they are essentially gigantic mainframes, right? Um, just with very cheap components that are interchangeable and can be replaced at a moment's notice without the whole network going down. Um, AWS is essentially a the, the whole cloud is essentially a scaled version of, of what Plato was. Plato was essentially a cloud system. Um, but um, anyway, so. So, so let me ask you, I, I'd like to bring this home to our topic here at, at Floss Weekly, because uh, I'm wondering what the, what modeling, um, even what people, you know, uh, got leverage from the Plato experience into into the floss world that we have now. Uh, I'm going to interpret that as meaning um, who moved on from Plato, possibly into uh, well, it is you know, sensibility few, uh, as well. More know, recent, you know, what, what, yeah. Well, there, yeah, there's yeah. sensibility, and then there's actual people, and you know, yeah. uh, on on the on the actual people front, um, uh, a whole generation of of brilliant. Uh, computer science and uh, computer engineering folks um, came out of the Plato project, which um, by the mid seventies was partnering with Control Data Corporation, uh, one of the great old dinosaurs of, uh, you know, the mainframe era. And, uh, but um, they scattered all over the industry and wound up um, at Apple, at Google, at Microsoft, um, you name it, there were Plato people there. They were probably at Cisco and everywhere else. And uh, uh, some of them I know are now retired. Um, uh, I know a few people who had amazing runs where they would, you know, they joined Apple early in the 80s, did that for 20 years, and then joined Google and did that through that IPO for 10 more years or something. So, um, yeah, there's there's been amazing stories of uh, – uh, of people who were undergrads at the University of Illinois in the mid '70s, who wound up having fantastic careers. Probably the most fa famous Plato person is Ray Ozzy, who um, was one of the uh, uh, you know uh, junior system programmers at the University of Illinois, working at the the, the Plato project, um, and wound up working at uh, uh, deck afterwards and um, 
then starting Iris Associates after working with uh, at Lotus. Um, Iris was the company that you may recall um, invented Lotus Notes, which is um, very much influenced um, in spirit and design by and functionality by Plato Notes, which was the conferencing system on Plato. And, um, you know, that wound up being acquired by IBM for like three and a half billion dollars. Um, and Ray went off to do uh, lots of other interesting things, one of which was Talco, which is named after Talkomatic on Plato. And that got acquired by Microsoft. And, uh, you know, he wound up being essentially the chief software architect. He had Bill Gates's old job in the early 2000s. Um, he's now off doing even, you know, new and more interesting stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's an example of, of, you know, the kind of uh, 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 people who have come out of the Plato community and gone on to do really interesting things. Um, there, there was a sensibility, speaking of, you know, free software and that kind of thing, of, uh, uh, you know, if you read hackers and you read about the hacker ethic, um, you would see that a lot on the Plato system um, among, you know, the undergraduate and even high school students who, um, you know, uh, would uh, share software. Um, they sometimes wouldn't even put passwords on their source code so that anybody or they at least allow it to be inspectable so anybody could read it and learn. And um, we would see this a lot, uh, uh, you know, uh, and it would it, uh, when the web came out. Um, I think if browsers had not had the ability for anyone to view the HTML source, um, you know, the web may have taken a much longer time to develop. Um, but because anybody could inspect the source, I think that inspired a lot of people like, you know, to basically say, um, I can do that, you know, and go off and give it a shot. And uh, there was a similar kind of ethic among many developers at Plato um, who would share, um, you know, uh, the code. Now, there were a lot of in insanely popular multiplayer first person shooter dungeon games and stuff like that that were so wildly popular. Um, the source code was was an absolute state secret, practically, and they guarded it uh, you know, fiercely, um, uh, just to give you an idea of the l levels people would go to, to try to get the source code to a game like empire, which was the famous, you know, star Trek, like uh, space war game. Um, you know, uh, at the university of Illinois, there was a, a, a large printer and you could submit a print job requesting a printout of something. And the operators would put all the prints that users had requested in an out bin and you would just come and fetch your huge, you know, um, deck of uh, fan fold uh, uh, source code printout. And people would check the out bin to see if the authors of any games had just submitted requests. And that was a popular way of stealing the source code to things like Empire and other games Um you know, before the authors of the game could come downstairs or whatever and fetch it. Um, and, you know, so, uh, but there, uh, you know, when I used Plato at the University of Delaware, um, there were a number of uh, developers there who very much had the hacker ethic and uh, very intentionally left their, their source code open, truly open source. Uh, anybody could copy it. Anybody could modify it. Uh, that would open up discussions which were encouraged, like, you know, why did you change this? Oh, that's a good idea. Did you think of this, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there, there was no movement. There was no organized uh, you know, set of, you know, organizations or anything like that that would emerge later, I guess, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I think the spirit was the same. And um, that certainly uh, helped uh, ideas expand and um, uh, people to come up to speed with programming techniques a lot sooner because there was a lot of code that you could use so that you, you know, that someone had, else had written so that you didn't have to write things from scratch. 
So I know Sean and I both have more questions, but first I need to tell you this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Security Scorecard. Uh, Security Scorecard is the global leader in cybersecurity ratings and the only service with 1.5 million companies continuously rated. Their mission is to empower every organization with collaborative security intelligence because you are only as secure as those you work with. They help enterprises manage digital threats with a 360 degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. Their patented rating technology is used by over 1,000 organizations for multiple use cases. Those include self-monitoring with security scorecard ratings. You evaluate your organization's cybersecurity risk using data-driven objective and continuously evolving metrics that provide visibility into your organization's information security control weaknesses. And it's third-party risk management. Uh, instantly in, uh, view the cybersecurity posture of any third-party vendors, partner, or suppliers to help you evaluate risk in your ecosystem. It can also allow them to find and fix cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities across their externally facing digital footprint. They are also used for board and executive level reporting and in the insurance space for cyber insurance underwriting. The security scorecard non-intrusively collects data from publicly available feeds across the internet for an outside in perspective. The data is used to calculate scores across 10 key risk factor groups, such as patching cadence, application security, DNS health, network security, and endpoint security. An A2F grading scale helps companies easily understand and continuously monitor the cybersecurity posture of any organization. Companies with a C, D, or F are five times more likely to be breached. Security Scorecard Atlas is the leading cybersecurity questionnaire and validation solution. It cuts through the questionnaire noise so you can find out your score to make your business cyber secure. Atlas's secure, uh, centralized platform leverages machine learning to automate the cybersecurity questionnaire exchange process for senders and receivers, making it two times faster, more accurate and secure. Atlas is the only platform on the market that instantly maps cybersecurity rating data to individual responses, providing a true 360 degree view of risk. Cut the questionnaire cycle in half, save hours with 20 plus industry standard questionnaires or their custom questionnaire wizard. Collaborate easily and securely with your team and third parties on that. Security Scorecard believes that every business has a right to its own cybersecurity rating. They were awarded best product security ratings by 2020 SC Magazine Awards. The combined power of Security Scorecard ratings and Atlas gives organizations a 360 degree view of cybersecurity for any company in the world. Sign up for your free account by visiting securityscorecard.com slash twit. Check the score of your business and up to five others to learn more and sign up for your free account. Visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. And uh, Sean, I know you had some uh, a, a question that was burning there along with your I do. flamethrower. I, behind I do. I have so many, so many questions, but uh, so well, you're, things you're not a flamethrower, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's not. Yes. So, yeah, no, I, I yeah. that's you, a different You have not there. a flamethrower on your wall, right? <laughs> you are correct. It is not a flamethrower. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so my question is literally about the orange glow. The, the thing that I was struck with the Play-Doh program is just how um, it, it just felt very um, open sourcey in the development model in that even at the hardware level. I mean, you mentioned it, but I, I mean, it's so significant. They literally invented a plasma screen uh, using wires and glass and neon gas and epoxy um, because they wanted to have, a, you know, a screen that would work. And then the orange glow came from because it was hard to see. So they just added some extra neon lighting around the edges that kind of bled in. I don't know. It was just fascinating. And on top of that, uh, the input device, they developed a, an infrared touch screen for this four inch, um, just newly created um, 
product that they use specifically for Plato. I, I was just impressed by not only how the development of hardware was uh, done at a, you know, we need to solve this. So we're going to solve this in the most efficient, cheapest way possible, but also in the software. Uh, sorry, these questions have been building up um, uh, the the software, for example, like the, the tutor program or, or system or whatever to create content for Plato. Uh, it, that was a survival of the fittest, right? That worked the best. And so uh, the other option was abandoned. I just, I guess, did the did the development model of hardware and software where just the the most brilliant, efficient, cost effective methodology won out? Did that continue through the entire Plato process? And again, I, I haven't finished the book. So, you know, I'm kind of asking for some spoilers on how did it continue to progress that way? Because that was a fascinating way that the system started. Right. Um, well, yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, let me to unpack. I mean, the, the, regarding the plasma display, the thing to understand is in 1960, you know, when when this tiny little uh, team it was like two or three guys, uh, Donald Bitzer was uh, 26 years old, had just uh, gotten his Ph.D. in um, electrical engineering. And he was given the green light to lead, lead the Plato project, which is what he 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 gave it the name. And um, they realized right away, well, we're going to need a computer. We're going to need some sort of input devices um, for the student. And we're going to need some kind of output back to the student to be able to see stuff. And since it's all supposed to be educational, we're going to need text. We're going to need graphics. And we really should have the ability to display pictures. And so... Um, that drove a lot of the the vision for what they wanted to do. Then, of course, they went out and looked at components, you know, in the 1960, 61 era and realized, well, there, there, there either aren't any or they're so ridiculously uh, wrong and, you know, archaic um, uh, to use RAM at the time would have cost two dollars per bit so imagine if you had a 512 by 512 pixel screen, um, you know, that's 264, 262,000 bits. Um, you're talking about a lot of money. And then to build a couple of thousand terminals, you're talking about a huge amount of money. And, um, you know, if memory today, you know, this is a, uh, this is the uh, Moore's law in action. If, if, Computer memory and processing power had never followed Moore's law. If that never existed and memory still cost two dollars a bit, the MacBook Pro I am talking into right now would run, I think, about one point three billion dollars just mine, you know, um, and everyone else's would be about that, too, just given there's multiple gigabytes of memory in the thing. Um, so clearly using video RAM was not going to work and they uh, you know, I, I have a whole chapter about how they came up with this idea of uh, looking. They, they, this is an amazing connection that most people don't realize. Is that there, there's a famous name in the Silicon Valley mythology of computing, which is uh, uh, Douglas Engelbart, who is famous for his NLS system and the famous quote unquote demo of 1968 that inspired so many people, and rightfully so. For doing so many things that would would uh, you know we all take for granted today in terms of document sharing and collaboration and, and and communication online in a network and that kind of thing. But before all of that stuff in the late 50s, Douglas Engelbart was was at Berkeley working on plasma technology for memory and for displays, and um, he he filed a whole bunch of patents. You can go read them; they're all in Google patents. And it's very interesting to look at. Um, he was thinking about using uh, plasma, uh, AC plasma, as a um, memory device um, because it basically it's, it's uh, thousands of, of cross-hatched wires and uh, neon gas. And, you know, you have an address for the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and you, you fire up those two wires and where they cross um, – you know, a little bit of neon would would um, would glow, and that's that is actually memory. And the Plato team really liked that idea. Um, Engelbart never got it to really work, 
and he was absolutely frustrated at trying to get display technology to work using plasma um, and the grid of wires and everything. And pretty much everybody in the industry at the time, including you know IBM and the DoD companies, all the, all the defense contractors and everybody, because that's where all the money was, uh, were looking at this. The computer companies were looking at it, and everyone basically said it's impossible. It's too much work. It's too hard. And of course, this motley crew of, of electrical engineers and uh, and you know scientists at uh, Illinois kept at it, and they found some language in one of the patents that um, Engelbart had filed that said, you know, I considered going down this path, but it didn't work, and so didn't go down that path. And you know, Bitzer and company at at the Plato Project said, well, maybe we should go down that path. And I talk about this in detail in the book where basically they figured out um, some ways to get it to actually work. The, the, tru the trouble was trying to um, keep the, 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 uh, the little uh, dot of neon actually to keep it to stay on. Um, if you, and, and the way you do it is you send a spike of, of voltage um, and then you reduce the voltage. But... Um, the spike is enough to excite the gas around that intersection of, you know, of wires and the gas stays on and it will stay sustained um, at a lower voltage. So um, they built this apparatus and they kept making, you know, first they tried, you know, two wires and one dot. Then they tried four wires and, and you know, it kept multiplying and then it was 16 um you know, pixels and then 256 and eventually, you know, it was 512 by 512. And um, so, you know, that's how that all developed. It, it, it's an absolutely remarkable story. And um, uh, for a long time, they were thinking about using blue dots. And um, but they decided that orange was friendlier. And um, the phrase friendly orange glow was a very common phrase you would hear around the Plato community. Um, it wasn't something I made up. It, it was a real term. And and um, you would go into a darkened Play-Doh classroom and um, it would be like, you know, um, there's a scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind at the opening of the movie where you're at an air traffic control center and all you see is all these workers, you know, eight uh, the controllers sitting around these huge terminals and um looking at the screen in its very dark room other than the glow from the screens. And that's what it was like in Plato classrooms. Uh, people preferred often to turn the lights off and just have these orange screens all over the place and um, people in front of them. And the orange would be reflected on their faces. It was really kind of a surreal situation, but that was what the Plato experience was like. And, um, all during the night, you'd have gamers playing these games until six in the morning um, and staggering out of the building like zombies to go have dinner at six in the morning, you know, uh, which is a story in its own right. But anyway, um, so, yeah, the the laboratory was very unusual in that it had the necessary philosophy of whatever works and encouraging people to try new ideas and um, may the best idea win um, kind of thing. And so there was a fierce competition for um, ways of doing things both in hardware and in software. For a long while, um, there was the hope to build a networked high resolution, like 20, 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz full spread audio network so that um, people could have digital interactive audio and headphones, you know, while they're interacting with their learning material. Maybe um, they're taking a French lesson and they want to hear the audio and everything. And someone actually built that system. But of course, the bandwidth was the killer. And so uh, they, you know, that system didn't survive. Um, they built instead uh, a 15 inch floppy disk drive with, um, uh, and it wasn't even digital. It was analog recording of audio on a floppy disk, random access and digitally controllable through the terminal so that, um, 
you know, each student would have one of these audio machines next to their terminal or on top of it. Um, if they're in a, in a language class, for example, and there were a lot of language classes using Plato, uh, the largest um, uh, site in the entire Plato world in terms of terminals was the foreign languages building at the University of Illinois, which had about you know 80 terminals and cost millions of dollars to build. And each of those um, had its own audio disc player and that kind of thing. Um, so you, there were lessons in French and Spanish and Russian and Hebrew and all kinds of languages. Um, it was a major operation. Um, so there, were, there was a lot of that kind of innovation going on. Uh, Donald Bitzer really deserves most of the credit for um, encouraging and fostering that. Um, unlike most computer labs, even those written about in the hacker's book, like at MIT, they were real locked down kind of places. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Levy talks about the, uh, uh, the priesthood of operators who would work the mainframes and, and take your request and actually interact with the computer and all that stuff. And the hackers hated all that. And, um, the, the lab at Plato was quite different. Basically, if you walked in the building, they didn't call the cops you know, they would say like, you know, how can we help you? And would you like to sit down and, and try out Play-Doh? And, you know, would you like to, to learn how to program? And hey, would you like a job here? And I mean, it was an incredibly welcoming and encouraging kind of place. And that's absolutely due to Bitzer, his personality and his encouragement of young people. Um, and he had a practical reason for doing it too, because they were, they were affordable. If you hired a whole bunch of really brilliant high school kids who did who worked, you know, crazy hours and didn't cost you an arm and a leg, um, the kids were thrilled. Um, you got the work done. The system improved and you saved a ton of money. So there was a economic incentive for um, encouraging, uh, you know, uh, teenagers to uh, flock to the Plato project at Illinois for many, many years. That went on for, you know, over 20 years, 25 years, really, um, you know, from the 60s well into the 90s even. So, um, yeah, that, that, that culture, it, it's a classic lesson in the importance of developing a strong, encouraging, open culture. Um, where every, everyone is welcome um, and, you know, how, you know, let's hear your ideas. How can you help improve this thing that we're building? And uh, isn't it all so exciting and that kind of thing? A very different, you know, environment than many of the other labs around uh, the country. Uh, even, even Stanford was, was nowhere near uh, as open a, as Plato, which was kind of legendary. My take on on Don Bitzer was that he he truly just wanted everybody to contribute. And those who had the most to contribute is the ones that he wanted to work with, not those with the, the biggest resume and the Jets. Right. I mean, right. those are the, the high school kids. Uh, he sounds like you an incredible person to work with and, and get a lot done. I, so I have to ask because I, I'm sure we're running low on time, but um, electric cars. So you talked yes. about survival of the fittest um, uh, electric cars. I, I want to show my electric car just because I love it so much. Um, so this <laughs> is my city car, 1980 city car, full of batteries uh, on the back of my truck because, unfortunately, um, I burned out the the relays inside. But uh, talk to me a little bit about electric cars. I mean, what are your thoughts on um, the transition from uh, traditional fossil fuels to electric cars? Um, uh, do you see that as a survival of the fittest? Is this uh, is this just a trend? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, the first thing I, I got to say is, your electric car reminds me of what the Play-Doh terminals looked like. Here's a, see if I can show this. Um, uh, there, oh, cool. that's a, that's Richard Powers, the famous author, sitting next to a Play-Doh terminal in the foreign language building with one of those disk drives on top of it. But uh, that's what they looked like. They, you know, with the do any the do any still yeah. exist? Are there any of those um, orange glows in existence? There are a handful left. Um, I, I mentioned late in the book, um, spoiler alert, that, um, you know, it's one of the great tragedies of this technology history story um, that the University of Illinois 
grew less and less enamored with the Plato system over time. And um, especially in the 90s, as the web was rising and NCSA had become the darling of the campus and was receiving millions of dollars in money and everything. And the order came one day um, for the maintenance crew that, that maintained the Plato terminals to gather them all up, take them to a dump and sledgehammer them into oblivion. And so the vast majority of Plato terminals were destroyed by the University of Illinois. Now, um, Control Data made it their own terminals using CRTs, and that's I talk about that extensively in the book. Um, so there are very few gas plasma displays left. Amazingly, the ones that are left all work. After you know, essentially 49 years, they were they were all built in the, around 71, 72, and um, there uh, the Computer History Museum in um, uh, Mountain View, California, uh, was given a bunch of them, but they're, you know, mysteriously, the Computer History Museum uh, has not been a very friendly place for the Plato system. There's no exhibit. Um, they don't particularly acknowledge, you know, the importance of the Plato phenomenon in the history of computing, which is still an ongoing shame. Um, so they have some you know, just kind of like the uh, scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where where the, the crates are being rolled into that massive warehouse where top men are going to be working on them. Um, there are crates of Plato terminals somewhere in deep storage at the Computer History Museum. Now, the Living Computer Museum in Seattle was a very different place with a very different philosophy, and they loved them, and they managed to get two um, Plato uh, terminals that are fully, fully functional. And there's a guy named Aaron Wolfson who did an absolutely miraculous job um, uh, incorporating Ethernet into the terminals. And then uh, with a, cir a circuit board that knows how to slow down the network to, you know, um, uh, 1200 bits per second or 4800. Um, as a serial connection. So it converts Ethernet to, but w the, the bottom line is uh, the Living Computer Museum put two of these terminals on display connected to cyber1.org. That's C Y B E R, the number one, dot O R G, which is a live Plato system on the internet. And um, most of the games and the famous stuff that I write about in the book is all there. You can still play them. And, you know, there are still diehard Plato gamer addicts still going strong on that system after, you know, an embarrassingly long number of decades. I'll just put it that way. But they're still there. You can see them, especially in games like Avatar and Empire and stuff like that. They're, they're there every day and night. Um, but uh, uh, the Living Computer Museum did put the terminals to work and anybody could walk in the museum and sit down and play with them. Um, it was a tremendous uh, opportunity to educate the public. And um, when I did the book tour for this book back in 2017, I did a talk at that museum and then we all went up and, you know, looked at uh, the terminals and everything. They actually have a, uh, a cyber mainframe um, that would have run Plato and it probably, they probably could be, set up to run Plato even now, um, that's fully restored. Now, the sad thing is because of the pandemic, the museum is closed and there's a chance that it may never open again, which is a real historical tragedy. And I wish there were some way that we could all collectively get together and maybe lean on some of the tech billionaires out there to, f to find a way to help uh, you know, keep that museum going because it, it, it is absolutely unique in the world you know, they have an absolutely priceless collection of restored functional equipment that the public is allowed to actually sit down and play with. They have all the Macintoshes, the Xerox Park Alto, you know, all the historic famous computers, and then, you know, two Plato terminals as well. And, um, you know, if, if that place ever opens, I highly encourage people to go. It's a wonderful experience. You could spend the whole day and get lost there um, playing around with everything. So, so I have a question about um, 
uh, Tesla in New Mexico, and, yeah. and we don't have a whole lot of time left. So, but I'm I'm wondering, especially about um, how how you're helping Tesla remotely in a way. I mean, it is it, you know, what's the problem with New Mexico, and how did you, in an almost open sourcey kind of way, get together with other Tesla owners there to make up for the absence of Tesla in the in the state that hates them? Right. Um, there, well, it's uh, we we can thank the franchise auto dealers around the United States who um, have a very interesting history. Um, uh, many, many, many decades going back to the '40s and the '50s ago, um, uh, the dealers felt that they were being threatened by the the manufacturers that they represented. Um, the, the manufacturers did not treat dealers well. Manufacturers had all the control, all the power. And for example, you could lose your dealer's license on a whim and a manufacturer would, would hand your, the license to someone else to set up across the street and you're, you're toast. And a lot of dealerships are family run businesses and, um, you know, they would invest potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in a huge dealership only to lose it because of the whims of the manufacturer. Um, the manufacturers also were often keen on wanting to just sell their cars themselves. And um, so over the years, the dealerships tried to establish federal laws in Congress to give them some additional support. Um, Congress said, no, this is a state issue. And so, um, just like with real estate, you know, real estate laws are pretty much, you know, similar but different in 50 states. Um, uh, the dealership laws are similar but slightly different with, you know, minor little detail differences in 50 states. And but the general intent over the years was that um, uh, the dealers would protect themselves from those evil um, uh, manufacturers. And. Um, long story short, by the late 90s, early 2000s, the laws were essentially um, absolutely enshrining the entire business model of auto dealers, which is essentially the ultimate middleman, right? Um, you know, you do not buy a car from GM, you buy a car from a GM dealer. And um, imagine if you had to buy an Apple iPhone from Best Buy, you, there were no Apple stores because Apple was banned because they're the manufacturer and you had to go through a reseller, an authorized reseller or a dealer or whatever. And um, so Tesla emerges in this uh, world in the, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so um, and once it has decided to sell direct and bypass dealers altogether. And they were not a threat in the early years, you know, with the Roadster. And then when the Model S came out, they started, you know, dealers started wondering what the heck's going on here and got their lawyers, got their lobbyists and started um, either suing or otherwise threatening and harassing Tesla if they so much as dared to, you know, build a store or a service center in a given state around the country. Um Things worked out okay in some states. California has been very Tesla friendly since they have the factory there. There are, you know, stores and service centers numbering similar to maybe Starbucks's in California for, for Tesla. But um, in states like New Mexico, the dealers are incredibly powerful still. They're very protective. There are mostly families that go decades back. And, um, you know, there's only 115 or so dealerships in the whole state. Um, and they they have such an incredible sway over the legislature and the governor that Tesla has not been able to uh, uh, get laws changed or find a way to get a loophole added so that they can at least open one store even or one service center. And so customers out in New Mexico basically have to get service from Denver, El Paso, or Phoenix, which means, you know, you may need a hotel stay um, to get your car worked on. Uh, it's a very expensive, inconvenient kind of thing. Um, I moved out here with my wife in 2015. 
un, uh, uh, I had owned a Model S for two years already. I came from California. I had no idea what I was getting into. I arrive and discover that there are no service centers or stores. That's kind of scary when you have a car, you know, that there's no service. It's 400 miles to the nearest service center. And um, so I started contacting the governor's office. They said, it's not our problem. It's the legislature. So I contacted the legislature. And then I started contacting other Tesla owners and discovered everybody was frustrated with this. And um, so I founded a group called the Tesla Owners Club of New Mexico in 2015 with the express purpose of essentially being an activist group to try to get the legislature to change their minds and allow at least one store slash service center in the state. And we've been at war with the dealers and really the legislature ever since. We have not yet prevailed. Um, the Tesla Owners Club is up to almost 430 members now, and um, we're still very intent on you know fixing the law. This is not the only state in the country. There's probably about uh, something like 15 or 20 states still that, that outright ban Tesla. And um, they can't ban you purchasing it over the internet. So every state has Tesla owners, but they can do a heck of a job making your life miserable and forcing you to with hotel stays or whatever. You know, if you get if your car completely breaks down or gets bricked, for example, which is something that thankfully rarely happens, where the computers in the car seize up and your machine, your car is dead, then you have to get it towed, and it can cost like eleven hundred dollars to get it towed to Denver or El Paso or something um, if you live in New Mexico. So it's a real nightmare, and you know the dealers could care less, and it's gotten to the point now where with so many different auto manufacturers announcing electric vehicles that are coming out, you're now in the situation where it is clearly a protective, a protectionist, anti-competitive um, effort on the part of the dealers um, to block the best-selling electric vehicle, American-made in the United States, by um, uh, but allow people to come and learn and see and touch and feel and test drive competing electric vehicles at the dealerships. But, you know, you're not allowed to go near Tesla and there's no test drives, there's no stores, you know, and that kind of thing in this state. So, you know, it's pretty obvious that it's, you know, an anti-competitive move. It's very successful so far. It has really discouraged the adoption of EVs in the state, um, you know, Tesla should have 10,000 owners in the state by this point, and it has about 1,100. And um, you know, that is what happens when the public doesn't have a chance, you know, to be walking by the Apple store in the mall and see a Tesla store, and walk in and talk to the people about the cars there, and make an appointment for a test drive, learn about electric vehicles, and and maybe go home with one. Um, that's how it works in every other state, and that's how California has been so wildly successful with Teslas. You see them everywhere. Um, that should be the case across the country. The interesting thing is it's the case all over the world. It's only the United States that has these arcane, very protectionist dealer laws. Tesla can open up a store or a service center wherever it wants, whenever it wants, in any country of the world except the United States because of the regulatory capture that the, the dealers um, enjoy over state legislatures in many states still. And I would argue New Mexico could be the worst case of the whole country. So yeah, we, have a, we still have a big fight ahead of us, um, but you know, we're, we're not going anywhere and uh, the dealers hate us. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a fun battle. They know they're losing and, you know, um, uh, their days are numbered. So we'll just if we have to wait it out, we'll wait it out. But, you know, every year we go back to the legislature trying once again and we'll do that in 2021. OK, so we are actually like three or four minutes past out of time. So um, uh, I'm going to just ask you one final question. We actually ask everybody and then uh, uh, and, and wrap it. And that is what is your 
favorite uh, text editor and scripting language? Oh That's our man! Um, oh, this will start wars. I, 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 my favorite text editor. Well, understand that I'm mostly not coding lately. I'm, you know, since 2013, I've been working absolutely full time on books. I'm working on a new book. Um, I, I, uh, because the Plato Project, uh, the Friendly Orange Glow book, took so long to write. I learned very quickly that I couldn't rely on an operating system or a word processor because I would outlast it. The project would outlast it. You know, I started in WordPerfect, if you remember that. And uh, where's that today, right? And um, I've never been really a fan of Microsoft Word. So I wound up using essentially uh, VI and um, simple text editors, text edit on a Mac, um, stuff like that. For many, many, many years, I've kept everything in ASCII for the text. I did all my interviews in plain ASCII text and with, you know, either VI or um, text edit. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was painful, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a uh, uh, fan of some of the other, you know, the, the uh, what's the, the other big uh, text editor that is list based. I, um, you know Emacs? what I'm talking about, Emacs. Yeah. No, no, um, so yeah. Emacs. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I know well, lots of people who are Emacs fans, but you know, I, I generally use VI or or um, even BB Edit or or something like that and text edit on a Mac. And then when the book had to go to production, you dump it into Word, and that's how they like it. And yeah, that's fine. But that's then the, I all the publishers want Word. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, a VI, I know from other people here, is in fact the correct answer. So it was keeping things in plain huh. text. Um, and th thank you so much, Brian. This has been really great. And uh, and I really appreciate having you on the show. There's a lot we left untalked about um, that we we should tempt people with next time, like that you invented the emoji long before that uh, Moco did or whatever. Domoco. So, Docomo. I'm. I'm flubbing that so thanks uh, thanks a lot and um uh and so sean how'd that how'd that go for you we only got a short time to reminisce on the last i hour. know <laughs> i know i i wanted to talk so much about so many things <laughs> but again there's only so many minutes in a in an hour um no it was great i and, and seriously, if you haven't read the book, it's so fascinating, not just about Plato, but just about uh, going through the 60s and 70s and, and how the, the computer world was invented. It's just it's a fascinating read. Uh, so I, I encourage you to read that book as well. It's it's awesome. Also, the audiobook yeah. is great. I actually I'm an audiobook guy. I listened to the audiobook of the Friendly Orange Glow. And um, yeah, you can't go wrong. It was great. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure Brian didn't narrate it well. I, um I, I started the book. I'm not as far with it, along with it as as you are, but he's done such a tremendous amount of work on this. It's an important part of an important part of history. So, what have you what have you got to plug uh, before we move on? Uh, I actually I don't really have anything to plug. I can show you more pictures if you want to see a picture. Here's here's my <laughs> other cars. Uh, the, these are my two Volkswagens. Um, I'm hoping oh, really? someday wow. that they will both be electric, uh, but they're currently not. Um, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I'm I still making videos those. at CBT <laughs> Nuggets. So, yeah. When I was 18, I rolled a Volkswagen. Uh, they're a they're fairly Volkswagen. round, so that works. They're I mean, very yeah. round. It, and it happens slow enough so I could just watch the pavement come up to the window three times. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I walked away, which is, which is fortunate. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just plug Customer Commons, which I, I do most weeks. Uh, that's customercommons.org. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll be going out for funding soon, and uh, I'm very enthused about uh, the good work we're doing there. So that's uh, that's one of the ways that we're 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 moving on. So uh, so thanks so much, uh, uh, Sean. Um, and uh, I don't have in front of me who we have on next week, but I'm, oh, it's Brian Bellendorf. I'm pretty sure. If it's not Brian, it's going to be him in an upcoming week. Um, a primary author of Apache. Uh, he runs the Hyperledger project at the Linux Foundation, so oh, that's going to be a good. Yeah, that's going to be a good show. So thanks everybody, um, and uh, see you next week. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. 
Got a question for you. Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more.